Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're gonna visit with a YouTuber named Andrea Christian Parks. And the name of her video is The One Thing Preventing You From Weight Loss. I've always been the type that believes that certain people, certain coaches, certain motivational speakers have magic words. And when they talk to us, sometimes things click. And I'm hoping this is one of those videos that clicks for some of us. So with that being said, let's hear what she has to say. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Andrea Christian Parks. I am a Christian physician and weight loss coach, and I am here to help. So here's what's happening underneath for so many of us. Um, when we are wanting to lose weight, we believe what God has said, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We want to honor God with our bodies, and we have tried to lose weight. We have given a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of um, focus and research and trials and failures in the name of successfully losing weight. And if you're here still wanting to lose weight, that means that it hasn't worked yet. But here's what happens. And this is the coaching part. So I want you to listen because it might be different than you've thought about this before. When we have tried something and failed, we experience two major emotions. We experience disappointment and we experience um, failure. Now, I know failure is an actual thing, but also it's we, we feel something about failure. Mostly it's the disappointment. So let's work with that one emotion of disappointment. Disappointment is very hard to feel. And so what happens is when people feel disappointment in whatever situation, they then decide, uh, I don't want to feel that again. So in the future, we decide I will not do the thing that causes me to feel disappointment. So with weight loss, though, the problem is we try, we fail. We try, we have some success, and then we gain the weight back. And so what's happening is we get some positive reinforcement and some negative, and the negative part is that disappointment of, well, I didn't get it all off, or I got some of it off, but then it came back. And it's that, oh, I can't get this right. That disappointment feels really heavy. So when we decide we're not going to do that anymore, and I don't want to feel disappointed anymore, then the next time it comes up and you think, I really do want to lose this weight. And I really do want to honor God with my body. And I really do want to treat this temple of the Holy Spirit that God has given me well. And part of that is stopping overeating, losing the weight that's making you sick. Some of you all have diagnoses. You're taking medications. You want to stop taking those medications. But in order to do that, you've got to lose the weight to get healthy enough to not need them. And that is possible. I have clients who do that. But the weight loss has to come. But here's the thing. When we don't want to be disappointed, then we do things like quit in advance so that we don't have to feel disappointed. And what's underneath all of that, really way underneath the disappointment, is fear. And fear is awful. Fear is paralyzing. Fear makes us not want to do anything. And so... We decide out of fear, it's not a great place to make a decision. Fear is not a good place to make decisions, but we do it all the time. Fear, we decide, I don't want to feel disappointment. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to try anymore. And so then when you get someone like me in front of you who's saying, no, you can do it. You can do it. You get this back and forth. I, I don't, I, well, maybe I should, maybe I should. I'm not sure. I, and all of that is what keeps you stuck. You don't move forward. You just stay where you are. And it's out of the fear and the disappointment and the fear of disappointment that holds you in place. That makes sense. If you think about it, you know, if you need to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds, you know that there's going to be a lot of work involved, right? We can baby step into it, but there's no real way to slice and dice it other than the knowledge that there's going to be some work involved. And there's a big piece of all of us that doesn't like investing that much time, energy, and effort into something that's going to be fruitless at the end, right? 
But that's why we got to tell ourselves when we embark on a journey, whether it be walking, drinking water, avoiding sugar, or all of the above, we got to tell ourselves that the goal is to be more healthy, not necessarily a number that's on the scale. What Andrea is saying here that I think is great is that ultimately it will come. You got to have patience and belief that everything that you do is pushing you in the right direction because it really is. The issue is your brain tells you that if you don't try, if you stop trying to lose weight, that you don't have to feel disappointed. And that's a lie. Your brain is lying to you. And I hate that because our brains do it all the time, but it's it's trying to protect us, but it's not doing a great job in this situation because looking forward to something, to being successful or wh- whatever it is, you, you cannot, you will never get that. You will never get there if you're coming from, I don't want to feel fear. I don't want to fear disappoint, feel disappointment. So what you end up deciding is I won't try and you just stop trying. And then when you stop trying, you're thinking, well, I don't have to feel disappointed because if in the future that I fail, then I don't have to be disappointed. But the truth is what you just decided is I will just feel disappointed now because if what you really want is to lose weight and you quit, then you are disappointed right now because you won't lose weight if you're not working at it, period. I think there's a big decision that we make willy-nilly sometimes when we decide that we're going to join a diet or exercise routine. And then everybody rolls their eyes because three or four days later, like clockwork, we quit. This is one of those situations where when people say you don't want to look at it like diet or exercise, you want to look at it like a lifestyle. It really is true because whenever you're doing something like walking or avoiding sugar or drinking water or counting calories or whatever the case might be, those are little weapons that you have, but they only work best over a long period of time. And what better period of time than the rest of your life, right? So with that being said, go get your shoes. Let's go for a walk. Hey guys, it's Jesse. I think some of you watch every day to see the story at the beginning of the show, and for that, I thank you. But sometimes I like to imagine that you tell yourself that maybe today you'll actually start walking with Jesse. And if that does describe you, I sure wish you'd let me know. I can do this, you can do this, we can do this, let's do this. Welcome to Walk Talk Men. Good morning, guys. Good morning, venters. So, there's a gentleman over there that's on a walk. I don't see him too often, but I see him once in a blue moon, and I noticed today he has a walking cane, and I just saw him for about 30 or 45 seconds just kind of rubbing his hip area. You know, like maybe he had woken up and his hip doesn't really feel too good, and he was kind of aiding it and favoring it as if he might have a little bit of of an arthritic hip, which happens to a lot of our seniors as we get older, right? You start hitting your 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and these arthritic feelings that can run in your gene code can start uh, start to show themselves. I think you've even heard of people that have arthritis. They can actually tell when there's enough moisture in the air, so they can actually be like a little rain detection system. People will even tell you, my goodness, I can tell when it's going to rain just by the aching in my bones, right? And it's a true story. It's kind of, uh, I guess if there is one gift of arthritis, it's the uh, gift of being able to tell when it's going to rain before your friends can, you know? Not the best gift in the world, but still a gift nonetheless, right? So anyway, the reason I bring this gentleman up, and I tried turning my camera where you could see, not him himself, but you know, just him from the back, right? We all have obstacles. And this week in Phoenix, Arizona, the weather 
for at least the next seven day forecast is basically 104, 105, 107. It just kind of bumped up from the uh, high 90s, tiny low 100s, to all of a sudden we're just full blown in summer. And here we go. And in Arizona, as you may or may not know, it doesn't stop at 105, 106, 107. It gets up to 115, 120, 122 every once in a blue moon. And those are things that can really turn a person, especially a new walker, can really turn you into a, let's just wait inside and we'll wait till after the summer to start our walking routine. And guys, I urge you to fight that. Even if today was your first day walking, and even if you live in Arizona and you can't walk until 2 or 3 in the afternoon when it's its absolute hottest, if that were the worst case scenario for you, I would still recommend that you walk, you know? And for some people, as horrible as it is for me as a YouTube channel to say, some people don't walk well. Uh, you know, listening to talk radio or listening to someone's voice like my own. Some of us need to listen to, you know, good music. You know, whatever your favorite music is, if that's what motivates you to walk, then turn off walk, talk, vent, turn on your music and really enjoy your walk. Sometimes you hear a peppy, upbeat song and before you know it, you're kind of dancing with the, with the groove and the beat. Guys, I've gone through many two, three, four, or five month period of my life where I just love listening to music while I'm walking. There's, there's no reason to suspect that you would be any different. Whatever gets you to walk, that's the most important thing. Now, obviously, I want you to subscribe and I want you to be a big fan and I want you to watch every single day. But at the same time, I have to keep in perspective that the number one goal that I have is the same goal that you have. I want you to lose weight. I want you to see how enjoyable a walk can be. So let's take it beyond weather. Weather is something that this time of year, it's tough for us that are living in Phoenix. It's tough for us that are living in Texas, uh, Florida, a lot of states where it can be really miserable hot. And whether it's a dry heat like the one that I live in, or whether it's a humid, moisture-ridden misery like you get in Florida and Texas, right? These are still times where ideally you don't want to stop walking. So what I really recommend, and this might be a first for some of us night owls out there, is I really recommend that if you wake up naturally at 7 or 8 and you have your first cup of coffee and you get out for your walk at, let's say, 10, it's kind of too warm in the morning already to be walking at that time. Is it impossible? Of course not. If you're trying to build a sweat, can it actually help you? I guess potentially. But again, because you don't want to be on a 45 minute to an hour walk and get dehydrated away from your home, you know, maybe carry a bottle of water. But my ultimate recommendation would be, and this might help you in more ways than one, Instead of going to bed at midnight, 1, 2 a.m., try to go to bed at maybe 9, 30, 10, 10, 30, 11, you know, a decent hour where you can get your five, six, seven, eight hours of sleep, whatever you need in your life, right? And so you can wake up early, get out, your, out, out of your door where it still feels decent outside. For example, right now, when I left my place, it feels warm but it doesn't feel unbearably warm. It doesn't feel like 105, you know? It feels honestly like it's already pushing 85. And it's probably not that hot. It's probably just that I have the sun directly on me. But for some of us, you might have to start planning your walk earlier in the day when it's a little cooler out. You might have to walk a route where there's maybe more shade. Because some of our cities have really good shade trees and where you're walking in your neighborhood, you might have big patches of shade. Walk down those paths when it's miserably hot. On the flip side, we have some people in the northeast part of the country where during the winter, it's practically like you live in Canada. Practically North Pole weather, right? Where it's absolutely freezing out. You might have horrible storms uh, during the winter. And so what I would recommend is 
when you're on a walk on a beautiful day, be a little proactive. See if you can come up with a game plan on how you can maintain your walks without any reason to quit. So that gentleman back there that was rubbing his hip, there's probably a lot of times where he just says, man, I am so much in so much pain that I can't even be bothered with the idea of taking a walk. It's just gonna make my life more miserable. But I have a feeling the reason the guy is walking is because walking actually does the opposite effect. It doesn't hurt you further. It helps you maintain that muscle. It helps you keep that fat off. So that, you know, could you imagine if on top of your arthritic hip you had, you know, a hundred pounds of excess weight? You know, so, you know, I, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, yeah, I suppose this is a great reason to quit, but he's out here anyway walking. So we can use people like that as inspiration. There's always a million reasons to quit, but there's always a million reasons not to quit and to keep going. So whether today's your first day, your 100th day, or your fifth year of walking, keep moving forward. There's just no other option. No matter what the weather is, you got to try to get in a bunch of steps. There, I said it. He's coming around, ladies and gentlemen. He's okay with steps. I am literally walking over a million ants, so if you see me start to smack at my legs and itch my, my body, it's because I just walked through literally a million ants. I don't think I've ever seen that many ants in my life. Probably wasn't the smartest for me to walk through them. You ever walk over ants and before you know it, they're biting your legs? It's amazing. Could you imagine if a giant stepped on us and we were able to just, you know, grab onto his leg hairs and start biting him? That'd be, that'd be crazy. That's what ants are doing. So I heard a funny story on YouTube and I don't know if it happened in Michigan or Texas, but they showed Judge Cedric, I believe his last name is Simpson. And I've seen, I've seen this particular judge before, but I thought he was in Texas. But according to the video today, I think he was in Michigan presiding over a case where a gentleman called in uh, to the courts and on FaceTime, or you know, at least he was on his phone, he was uh, dealing with his court case with, with Judge Simpson. And Judge Simpson says, what are you doing? Because the guy is literally driving his car while he's you know in court talking to the judge. And he goes, sir, are you driving your car now? And the uh, guy goes, well, hold on one second, your honor. I'm, I'm, go I'm going into a parking lot. I got in a little bit of a traffic situation. I'm driving into a parking lot now so I can be parked, so I can be a, a, a part of the court process here without any issues. So he quickly proceeds to park and Judge Simpson's like rolling his eyes. And Judge Simpson goes, you know, you're here today in this court because of the fact that you're driving on a suspended license and now you have the nerve to come into this courtroom via your via your phone while you're driving again obviously with a suspended license so he told him to stay there and he had cops go and pick the guy up and he automatically said you know you're guilty as charged and he had to go to jail and it just really makes you think what the heck are people thinking nowadays i'm going to cross over here so I can get about 50 yards through shade. This is how you cheat the system when you're walking. Look for every patch of shade you can get. So could you imagine you gotta, you're in court because you're driving on a suspended license and you are so stupid that you decide to come to court while driving on that suspended license again. I mean, what great way of saying, put the handcuffs on me, I'm guilty. And it was just so interesting. And the guy wasn't some hardcore criminal looking guy, just your regular looking dad looking guy, right? <laughs> but the guy drove himself into the, into the courtroom via his phone 
and right into jail. It was just like, oh my God. Some of us make such poor decisions, which is another reason if you're new to the show, I really recommend you take walks. You can actually eliminate some of these poor decisions in advance. Well, how's that, Jetchy? Well, the reason that you can do it is because I always urge people that when you're on your walk, be proactive. Take some proactive, uh, uh, well, how can I say this? Take the problems that you're dealing with in your life and instead of waiting till they get to the point of no return and you have to deal with them, deal with them in advance. Come up with a good game plan. Be proactive. The problem in today, today's problem that we're looking at is, what do you do when the weather doesn't agree with your walk? Well, there's multiple ways we could look at that. We could throw our hands up in the air and just say, hey, I live in the northeast part of the country. It snows every day during the winter. I just have to wait until the fall or I have to wait until the spring, right? And that's just a bad way of looking at things. If you absolutely live in an area of the country where it's too hot or too cold or too stormy to walk consistently, then you probably owe it to yourself to go check out a gym or a church or some sort of rec center that your city or state might have available where they have maybe an indoor track that you can go walk at. Now, it's one of those things where right now as I wake up in the morning, I'm not necessarily in need of, but I'm not against it. And that's what I'm saying for you guys. If the weather makes it too miserable for you to walk, then you obviously have to figure out an, another option. You got to give yourself as many options as you can. And if that includes ditching walking for, uh, you know, maybe stepping in place in the living room or something like that, then I'm not against it. Don't be lazy if you, if you can avoid it. But if you absolutely can't avoid it, then instead of being lazy, be creative, you know? If it means walking in place, staring at a wall and, you know, the empty room of your house, then so be it. If it means that you watch the Weather Channel to find that one day or two days out of the week when it's not as hot so you can still walk outside, then do it that way. But either way, the only way that our plan works is if you're consistently walking every day. So if that means you have to wake up earlier or you have to wait till the sun goes down so that you can stomach a walk, I recommend you do it. So we have a lot of walkers, and I think it was Sherry Ann. We have a lot of walkers that are finishing up this challenge. And I think Sherry Ann found herself on a plateau all of a sudden. Sherry Ann, you gotta remember that sometimes with weight, it's three steps forward and two steps back, right? Sometimes you're gonna lose three pounds followed up by a gain of two pounds. And you just have to look at those two weeks as a, hey, I lost a pound. You know, and sometimes that's the way it goes. What you want to make sure you do is don't ever let your scale become the enemy to the point where the scale talks you out of walking. You got to remember if you're gaining weight by walking and eating properly and avoiding sweets and stuff and you still gain weight, I always like to tell myself, well, how much would you have gained if you wouldn't have done that stuff? You know, sometimes we don't realize that when we plateau, that might have been a time in the past where you would have gained weight. I bet you never ever think like that, right? Or how about those moments where you do gain a pound or two despite doing the right things? I always like to tell myself, well, hell, if I gained a pound or two doing the right things, that might have been one of those situations where I might have gained four, five, or six pounds if I would have chose to do the wrong things. So again, you got to kind of look at it differently. And these are things that when you're doing, um, let's say you're having a week where you lose three or four pounds, followed up by another week where you lose three or four pounds. So a legitimate two week period where you lose five or six pounds. What you have to do on those days and those weeks when you're feeling good is tell yourself, okay, this means the next week or two, I might break even. I might only lose half a pound. 
this might mean that I might gain a pound or two. Because you got to try to remember that on any given day that you run into the scale and weigh yourself, you might have a couple of pounds of water in your system that you just haven't pissed out yet, that you haven't sweated out yet. Every time you sweat, that's a little water exiting your body. So if you want to have a fun weigh in, maybe weigh in after you take your morning walk. But even when you sweat like crazy and you get on that scale, you might still have a little bit more water in your body than you anticipated. So again, some of you guys always mention the point. And what I mean by the point is, hey, I've lost 2.2 pounds. When you're looking at the point, whatever poundage you're losing, you might be taking your weight a little too intensely and too seriously. I think it's okay if you go from 190 pounds down to 185 pounds, that's great. But do you really need to know that you lost 5.2 pounds, you know? You might be micromanaging your weight a little too much if that's the case, right? And also, here's another thing. If you were to look at your grandchildren as they're growing up, right? And you would see uh, your three or four year old child every single day, you're not gonna notice their growth as much as somebody that sees them once every month, okay? You see your grandchildren once every couple of months, like a lot of grandparents do, you're gonna notice that, oh my goodness, Becky got three inches taller. It looks like Joey gained another 10 pounds. He no longer looks like a tiny little preschooler. He looks like a big boy second grader now, you know? You're gonna have these moments where you notice change. But if you're looking at the scale every single day, or if you're looking at little Joey every single day, you're probably not gonna notice much of anything. Have you heard those uh, double slit experiments that they do where they can take light and they can throw light through these double slits and on the other side of the uh, light they'll have a wall where you can see how the light reacts as it goes through the double splits. And one thing that they found out is with light, it looks different when you're actually observing it. So they throw light through these slits and the light goes through the slits and hits on the wall in a pattern, right? And they think it's consistent, but they notice that when they're not observing it, it reacts differently. And even when it thinks it's being observed, in other words, they've done experiments where they put a camera up, all of a sudden, the light has a different reaction. I'm not saying this very well because I forget how the story went, but I'm sure you've heard about the double slit experiment when it comes to light and how it reacts when it's being observed by humans and how it reacts when, it, when it's not being observed. It's two different realities. What that means when we apply it to us is that if you stare at the scale, it's not going to move. The best way for the scale to start moving is if you quit staring at it so long, okay? So, what I challenge you to do, what I challenge you to do if you're super interested in every single half pound or quarter pound that you lose, is instead of weighing yourself daily or even weekly, try to weigh yourself once a month. Because guys, what's gonna happen during that month is you're gonna have days that you literally lose two or three pounds. And you're gonna have days that you literally gain a pound or two and heck, somewhere in there, you're gonna have a half dozen days that you literally just don't have any change upward or downward. But at the end of the month, there is gonna be change, okay? And it's probably gonna be significant. It's probably gonna be four, five, six pounds per month that you're losing. But again, you're gonna lose more weight and feel better about yourself if you try to avoid it every single day. I believe it was Sherry Ann that said something like, I'm going to quit looking at the scale for my mental health. Sherry Ann, there's something to be said about that approach because the truth is, if you do look at that scale and four or five days out of the week, it doesn't tell you the number that you want to see, that's going to be four or five reasons 
why you might throw your hands up in the air and quit. But we don't want to have that happen, especially now that you've got about 60, 70 days under your belt with regards to your walking routine. And Sherry Ann, I might be selling you short. You might have been a walker your whole life for all I know, but this might be the first time that you've consistently done it each and every day. So what I recommend you do is take your own advice. Don't look at the scale every day. Maybe look at it every week, maybe every other week, or my ultimate suggestion would be take a look at it every month. And for you other people besides Sherry Ann, do you have any experience with this? Did you used to look at your weight every single day and now maybe you look at it once a week or once a month and you found out that it was better for your focus, your drive, and your positive vibes. We want you to have positive experiences when you walk. And if you're looking at the scale, expecting every walk to do something magical, it doesn't really work that way. So the next time you break even, here's my challenge to you. Tell yourself this, thank God I'm doing what I'm doing and I broke even this week because otherwise, how much weight would I have gained? I can only assume that if you're doing everything right and you broke even, that that means that if you were doing everything wrong, this would have been one of those weeks where you would have gained another two or three pounds. It's very challenging to tell yourself that, but what else is there? Because we know that for people that choose not to be active, have no exercise, eat like crap, we know that they tend to get bigger as time goes on. It's not like they magically just stay at the weight that they are. They get bigger, you know? So again, right before this diet started, you might have eaten your last couple desserts in your last couple days of just eating horribly, right? Because you told yourself, I'm gonna go on a diet and exercise routine. Well, foods that you eat poorly one week might equate to you being a little heavier the following week, you know? So when you're doing a diet and exercise plan and those first two or three weeks come and absolutely nothing has happened to your body, just tell yourself, I didn't break even. I avoided a three to five pound weight gain. Because I think that's what happens. Because what happens right before a lot of people take on a diet? They tell themselves, all right, one more piece of cake, one more Coke, I'm gonna start my diet first thing in the morning, right? And so most of us actually start our diet by having one last binge of something we shouldn't be eating. And I know that describes you because it describes me. You know how many times I told myself, I'm gonna have one more drink of sweet tea, I'm weaning myself off of it. And that's why when I started this challenge, instead of weighing 175-ish like I wanted to and like I thought I was going to weigh, I weighed closer to 185-ish. And I'll tell you what, I'm the experiment, right? So I can guarantee you that the heavier you are, even if it's only five to 10 pounds heavier than you'd like to be, it makes a significant difference in your journey. If you're 190 pounds today, start walking because it's gonna be easier than if you're 200 pounds tomorrow. I'm telling you, I never would have thought in a million years that at 185, it would be so much more challenging than it was when I was 175 pounds. And some people might say, well, Jesse, that might have more to do with your age difference. You know, you're 47 now rather than 42 or rather than 38. And when I say 38 and 42, those are the ages I believe that I was. You know, when you're walking a lot and losing a lot of weight and you're not really doing it for a challenge or a YouTube channel, you don't necessarily remember every single detail, you know? Do I have periods in my life where I don't walk? Yes and no. I have periods in my life where I might not walk 45 minutes a day, like, like when I was recovering from my surgery. But even when I was recovering from my surgery, you could not keep me down. I would take my butt bandage, right? Make sure that it was taped to my ass so it didn't fall off. And I would walk to the end of the street and back. So that was the equivalent of just a little five, 10 minute walk. But it kept me walking so that when I was able 
to go further, I went further. Some of you guys might wake up and you might say, oh my God, my feet are killing me today. Okay, if that's the case and you have to absolutely take the day off of walking, observe the two thirds rule, which states you're still gonna drink water all day, you're still gonna avoid sugar, you're just gonna give your feet a day off. By the way, a lot of you guys know I converted to a standing desk, what, four or five weeks ago. It's helping my backside tremendously. I mean, it's literally healing me in that regard, which is great. But it's giving me a brand new phenomenon and brand new issue that I've never dealt with. And that is now, at the end of the day, my feet hurt. Not just soreness, but legit hurt where I try to avoid getting on them. And I actually had to go buy one of these four foot tall stools because even though I'm trying to avoid sitting long term, I want to have something that I can sit at at my stand up desk every once in a while when my feet are hurting. So remember, when you solve one problem in life, and this is kind of crazy, but this is true, and I don't want you to think of it in a negative way, but you guys know this is so. Even if you were to lose 50 pounds and su supposedly cure this one problem or issue in your life, there's a damn good chance that it's just gonna be filled by yet another problem. So Jesse goes from having issues with his tailbone, right, and the skin in that area, to all of a sudden he's got problems with his feet. Are those problems long-term? I'm hoping not. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do, um, I'm trying to be proactive and take care of it before it becomes a, a hardcore issue. So one of the things I'm doing is, instead of, instead of standing in my house, because you know I work from my home, instead of standing barefoot where my foot is directly in contact with the hard carpet, instead I'm wearing my shoes, right? So I have cushiony shoes. When I go on my walk, I'm avoiding wearing Vans. Some of us love to wear Vans, myself included, and sometimes Vans just look really, really good. People of all ages can wear Vans. I don't know if you ever see a middle-aged person wearing Vans, but I think they look just as good as the kids wearing them, you know? But the problem with Vans is, my God, you might as well be walking barefoot. So now what I'm doing is when I go on my walks, I'm trying to wear my New Balance or my Reeboks, AKA my comfortable shoes. And I think if you're having foot problems, you should try to do that as well. If you know that you're supposed to be wearing certain insoles because you have a flat foot or you have something wrong with your arch of your foot, by golly, go to your doctors and get your insoles that you're supposed to have. If you have one of these situations where in order for them to give you a custom insole for your shoe, it costs an ungodly amount of money, four, five, six hundred bucks, and you don't have that, well then maybe you have to go to the store and get some generic Dr. Scholl insoles. Whatever you think you have to do to make it doable, do it. This is not the time to stop your walk when you have two or three weeks left in the challenge. Because these two or three weeks are gonna be really incredible two or three weeks. You gotta just keep going. And here's the question I have for a lot of you that have been with me since day one. We talked about this a month or two ago. When day 90 comes, some of you are gonna think mentally, the challenge is over. But guys, you gotta remember, this is no longer about a challenge. This is about a lifestyle. Everyone's always telling you it can't be a diet or an exercise plan. It's gotta be a lifestyle change. Do you realize that over the last handful of weeks or handful of months, you've actually changed your lifestyle? So the big question I want you to ponder today on your walk is, why the heck would I wanna go back to that old way that I was? If you've been walking every day and you're starting to enjoy the fact that your clothes are fitting looser, you're starting to enjoy the fact that you're naturally walking a little further each and every day, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. And remember, if my, uh, my show ends abruptly, it's because the camera got hot, right? But don't quit. Now is the time to keep stepping on the gas. I'm starting to see more and more people walk. And you wanna know something? I'd be willing to bet that one of my neighbors that's walking now 
probably sees me every single day walk and that might be motivating them. Why do I say this? When you're walking in your neighborhood, people are noticing you. You might be inspiring them to put their shoes on and to start walking. So again, you might end up having dozens of thank yous for changing people's lives that you never hear. That's another reason why it's important that you set a good example. Go on a walk every day and your grandchildren are going to want to be the same way as their grandparents, right? So walk, walk, walk. Don't ever stop. Have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you guys later. Keep walking!